Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Epworth United Methodist Church um, on this beautiful morning. <laughs> Shoveling snow is just what I wanted to do this morning. Um, and it's Palm Sunday. So uh, we're going to have some fun. Before we get started, I just want to make sure everyone knows you are welcome here. We are glad to be with you, whether you're in person or whether you're worshiping online. Um, praise be to God for your presence this morning. If um, you are a guest here and you haven't done so before, let us know you're here um, by signing our friendship register. That will be passed from the back of the sanctuary forward. And now, with all the preliminaries out of the way, why don't we stand and sing and praise God? Hymn number 278, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Let us call one another to worship. Behold, your king comes to you. He is just. He brings salvation. He brings peace. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us join his parade, surrounded by the last and the least, the left out and the lost. He rides in triumph towards the cross. Let us follow the one who brings freedom and peace and walks in solidarity with the abandoned and the oppressed. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now I'm going to invite you all to sit down, but don't get too comfortable. Getting some exercise this morning. And if we have any kiddos here this morning, I, I, you are welcome to come up at this time and bring your grown-ups too. And if I don't have any kiddos this morning, that's all right. Maybe I can ask our youth group to come up. Sure. Oh yeah, bring your palms, we need them. So, so you are going to be our leaders as we um, have a parade. And, and here's the way our parade will work. We, we are going to, in, in an act of emulation of Jesus and an act of solidarity with Christ and his followers, we are going to parade around our sanctuary waving our palms. And if you don't feel like parading, or parading might not be for you, that's okay. You can wave your palms from your seat, too. 
but you all will be our leaders. So I'm going to ask half of you to come on this side and half of you to go on this side. No, no, no. I'm wrong. I want all of you to go to the back. <laughs> I changed my plan a few times. <clears throat> and for the folks still in the pews, what we're going to do is the front will go first, and you'll exit outwards and go and join them at the back. And each pew will go back until we have a line that can come down the middle. We'll be singing some hymns as we come down the middle, and we'll decorate the cross with palms, as, uh, as is our tradition. And then you can head back around, back to your pews. The trick to that, and there's no good way to do this, is that you will be reversed when you're entering your pew again. So um, you'll have to... Deb, you'll have to wait for Joanna or the opposite of that. But do you think we can figure this out? Let's do this. So uh, let's go ahead and bring our front pews back and around to the back.
That's pretty cool, huh? We turn now to our confession of sin. The streets were crowded. A parade mood filled the air. Shouts came from deep in the heart. Hosanna, which means save us. And so we pray to you, O God. Save us from lukewarm faith. Hosanna, save us. Save us from callous indifference to the suffering of others. Hosanna, save us. Save us from paltry hopes and petty dreams. Hosanna, save us. Save us from unquenchable greed. Hosanna, save us. Save us from lazy habits and faithless commitments. Hosanna, save us. Save us from soft-mindedness and hard-heartedness. Hosanna, save us. We cry from the depth of our hearts and the very pit of our souls. Hosanna, save us. Save us now, O Christ. You are invited now to a time of silent prayer. Family of Christ, hear this good news. In Christ, God hears, God answers, and God sets us free. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's take a few moments to welcome one another as our choir comes forward to offer their gift of music.
Okay, so our youth and our kids are invited to Sunday school now. And I'll invite Deb to come forward and read our scripture lesson. I invite you to bow your heads for the prayer of illumination. In the reading and interpretation of the scriptures, O oh God, open our hearts to the story of your love. Open our minds to new ways of knowing you and open our doors to all whom you would welcome. Amen. The scripture lesson is from Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt, that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and, he, and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. May God bring a blessing upon the reading of the word. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we come before you today hoping to hear a word from you. And so our prayer this morning is the same as it always is. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts will be acceptable before you. For you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was a scene the people of Jerusalem were more than familiar with. A great procession in the city, accompanied with shouts of praise and trumpets sounding. The mood was patriotic and festive. You could feel the energy in the air. It was like, it was like the 4th of July for us. And as the procession drew nearer to the city gates, the people watching could see just how, this, how large this approaching parade was. The leader rode proudly atop his mount, and the cheering onlookers grew louder and louder as they came closer and closer. He wore gleaming armor, polished to shine brightly in the morning sun. His huge war horse cantered forward, and row upon row upon row of imperial soldiers and cavalry followed in his wake. Perhaps the crowds shouted, Hail Pontius Pilate, Roman prefect of Idumea, Judea, and Samaria. Praise to Caesar, Son of God, Savior of all. I'm sure some of these cries were sincere. 
many of those living in Jerusalem had benefited greatly under Rome's rule. Those willing to ally themselves with the wealthy, those willing to ally themselves with the wealthy and the powerful of Rome owed a lot to Caesar and Pilate and to the Jewish leaders that they had installed there like Herod. Plus, parades are fun, right? It's always a good time for a parade. It's an especially good time for a parade of Roman soldiers, though, during the Jewish Passover festival, celebrating Israel's liberation from Egypt. There's nothing like a few columns of soldiers to make sure those pesky Judeans don't get any ideas about liberation these days. It had become a long tradition, the Roman triumphus, Every year, thousands of Jewish pilgrims would make their way to the holy city of Jerusalem to make sacrifices and celebrate their freedom and the, the freedom their, their people once enjoyed and the, people, and the freedom they hoped they would soon enjoy again. And every year, Pilate would travel to Jerusalem too with a full regiment of soldiers. Their purpose was to reinforce the Roman garrison overlooking the Jewish temple and its courts. This parade was meant to say, we're stronger than you. This parade was meant to say, if you put your foot out of line, we'll make sure you know it. The Bible scholars John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg describe it this way. Imagine the imperial procession's arrival in the city, a visual panoply of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers in leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold, and the sounds the marching of feet, the creaking leather, the clinking of the bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust in their wake, and the eyes of the onlookers, some curious, some in awe, some resentful. This parade would come in through the western gate because they were traveling from Caesarea on the sea, a new and splendid city, way better than Jerusalem, about 60 miles to the west on the coast. Pilate's procession displayed not only imperial power, but also Roman imperial theology. According to this theology, the emperor was not simply the ruler of Rome. No, he was the son of God. It began with the greatest of emperors, Augustus, right? Who ruled Rome from about 31 before Christ to about 14 after. His father was the god Apollo, who conceived him in his mother, Atia. And inscriptions refer to him as son of God, Lord, Savior, the one who had brought peace on all the earth. After Augustus died, he was said to have ascended into the heavens to take his place among all the other gods in the Roman pantheon. And his successors, including Tiberius, who was the ruler at the time of Jesus' ministry and death, claimed similar son of godship. That was on the west side of the city. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the city, at the Easter Gate, there was another procession, another parade. Though they may have had similar numbers, this parade looked quite different. For one thing, this was a ragtag group of people, mostly peasants, and the one riding in was not on a war horse, but on a donkey and an unbroken donkey at that, one that had never been ridden before. I wonder if it didn't buck around in the unfamiliar setting, if it wasn't nervous that these people that it didn't know came and borrowed it. 
Instead of polished armor, I imagine these people gathered wore worn and dirty clothes. After all, they've traveled about a hundred miles so far from Galilee in the north, relying mostly on the compassion of strangers to host them as they went. As, <clears throat> as they entered the gates, some of those traveling with Jesus ran up ahead of him to throw their coats down before him. Was this an imitation of a king? Or was this some sort of satirical display to mock the way people adored the Romans? They cut branches from the surrounding fields to wave and to throw down before him. And while the one they hailed as king was also proclaimed the son of God, it meant something quite different from the claims of the Romans about Tiberius. Jesus' profession proclaimed the kingdom of God, a way of life built on grace and generosity rather than power and control. They sang songs like Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord because God is good, because God's faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel proclaim it. God's faithful love lasts forever. All the nations surrounded me once, but I cut them down in the Lord's name. The Lord's strong hand is ready to strike. The Lord's strong hand is victorious. Open the gates of righteousness for me so I can come in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate, after all. Those who are righteous enter through it. Lord, Hosanna, please save us. Lord, Hosanna, please let us succeed. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd say this looks a lot like a planned political demonstration. Doesn't it, though? It almost looks like Jesus and his followers are trying to say something about that other parade on the other side of the city. Borg and Crossan, those scholars, they continue... The meaning of this demonstration is clear, for it uses symbolism from the prophet Zechariah in the Jewish scriptures. According to Zechariah, a king would be coming to Jerusalem humble and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But the rest of the Zechariah passage details what kind of king this king will be. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to all the nations. In other words, this king riding on a donkey will banish war from the land. No more chariots, no more war horses or bows commanding peace to the nations, he will be a king of peace. Two processions, two kingdoms, two ways of leading, marching into the same city from opposite directions. Who will be victorious? Each side believed they would be the winner. Even now, as the end is approaching, the disciples, Jesus' inner circle, all those following him, they seem not to get what victory looks like with Christ. They think he will be triumphant. They still think Jesus will overthrow Rome, despite the peace that he preaches, despite all the times he's warned them that he is coming to his death. They still imagine a victory based on crushing their enemy with God's strong hands. There's only one character in the stories of Jesus' Jerusalem ministry in Mark who seemed to understand what victory in Christ would really look like. She's the focus of the second reading assigned for us today. From chapter 14, at a dinner being held just three days after this parade into town. 
Jesus was at Bethany, visiting the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. During the dinner, a woman came in with a vase made of alabaster and containing very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke open the seal on the vase and poured the perfume on his head. Some in the room grew angry. They said to each other, why, why waste this perfume? This perfume could have been sold for almost a whole year's pay and the money could have been given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. You always have the poor with you. You could do something for them anytime you wanted. But you won't always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body ahead of time for burial. And I tell you the truth, wherever in the whole world the good news is announced, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased, and they promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Palm Sunday in the church is kind of an odd, odd Sunday, because we start off with a big celebration. We start off with a parade. We wave our palms of victory but then we use them to decorate a cross, which is an instrument of suffering and sacrifice. Palm Sunday is also Passion Sunday. The dueling themes of this week speak to the grace, speak to the great conflict between the way of Christ and the ways of the world. It speaks to that tension between this parade and that parade. With all those crying Hosanna in our story, we proclaim a victory in Christ. But we're fortunate to have the benefit of hindsight, aren't we? Because we already know what those characters are about to learn. Sometimes victory looks like loss. Sometimes strength looks like weakness. Sometimes power looks like sacrifice. Like the woman at Bethany, we choose to worship the one who chooses grace and mercy over power and control. In her devotion, we see a model for us to follow as disciples. Because it's not just that this jar of perfume is expensive. It's not just about the money. It's that this jar represents her life savings. It's her life, her future, her legacy, something that she and her family have perhaps been working to be able to afford for generations. And she breaks her life open and she pours it all out for Christ. Like Christ who emptied himself for the sake of the world, this unknown woman who goes unnamed in the Gospel of Mark, she empties herself for the sake of Christ. And it is a very great loss, but it is also a very great victory. Now, later this week, um, on Friday, we'll have a service to tell the story of Christ's betrayal and death before Sunday when we celebrate his resurrection. We call this week Holy Week, and it is a holy week. It's also a hard week. We're up and then we're down. 
But that's kind of life, isn't it? Today we remember and today we celebrate that Christ's ways are not the ways of the empire. And we strive to follow Christ upon his way. Amen. We're invited to respond to the scriptures today by standing and singing our next hymn, number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? be seated. As our ushers come forward this morning, I invite you to be in prayer with me. Holy One, we give you thanks for your presence among us, for your leadership and your example, for the way that you show us another way to do things, for the ways that you delight us and make us laugh for the ways that you show us how silly some of the things we do are. As we enter into this holy week, we ask that you would take our hearts and shape them to be more like you. And we ask that you would receive these gifts, shape them, so that they may be for the community around us a sign of your hope, a sign of your grace, a sign of your love. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.
You may be seated. Now it's time to share our prayers with one another. I've lost a microphone. Oh, thanks. So if you have a prayer you'd like to share, just wave your hand and let me know. There's a little boy, Tobias, and I think he just turned 11. Uh, he's a cousin of my grandkids. Um, he had a tumor removed from the back of his head, his brain, on March 1st, and he had, uh, he's been in the hospital ever since, and they just uh, flew him to Spokane. He's doing a little bit better, but he's still on a feeding tube, and he's gonna have to have all kinds of different therapy and stuff to learn to walk and all that again, so. Yeah, thank you. For Tobias, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'd like to have prayers for a young man named Tyler. He's dealing with drug addiction and all the issues that go with that. And also prayers for the people that are trying to get him in to help. For healing from addiction, God... In your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, Epworth praises God for those that were fed last night in our fellowship hall and my prayer is that in this cold spell all people will find a safe and warm place god in your graciousness and your mercy hear our prayers We offer our prayers for peace around the world, but especially in Israel and Palestine and in Ukraine. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for you. We give thanks for this place where we can gather. We give thanks for all of the ways that you guide us. Walk with us now through this holy week. Help us to have the courage to face the downturns of life and help us to joyfully receive and celebrate all those moments of joy and blessing. In the name of Christ, in the name of Christ we pray, amen. If you came in the north entrance, you might have noticed the daily interlake page that was shown, that was um, in Sunday's paper and will be in, I believe, probably next Thursday's paper. They print that a couple of times. And um, as we've done the last several years, the United Methodist Churches in the Flathead Valley have paid for a full page. And so um, enjoy that. and. When you get home, if you're one of those few who still gets you know, the newspaper and can feel it and touch it, um, enjoy looking at that. The flowers that we're enjoying were uh, given to us by Isabel Matson's family after her memorial yesterday, and um, we're so thankful for, for Isabel. Um, looking at... Next Sunday, we start with the Easter brunch at 9 a.m., and I have got a deal for you. <laughs> There's only a few spots left where you can take that opportunity to provide some food or to help set up or to help clean up. Uh, so the sign-up uh, sheet is 
on the south entrance. And it even has some recipes for a couple of the salads that um, Jerry and, and uh, Sheila put on the menu for us. So please come and enjoy that. Are there other announcements? Oh, yes. Laverne, I even had your name written down. A big thank you to everyone that helped with the feeding the flathead last night. Uh, it went really well. We had several new people that have never helped before, so I thank them for stepping outside their security box and jumping in. So now they are trained and they're ready to help again. Uh, we had, I think, at least two people that haven't helped for quite some time. So they're back in the mold again. So this, it, the meal went really well. I appreciate everybody that brought cakes and whoever snuck an extra cake in there, thank you. <laughs> uh, we had probably 30 uh, people that actually showed up. But most of those are going to take, take out. There's no meal today, so they um, helped themselves. We actually served 94 meals last night, and it was really appreciated. Um, this morning, I had a, a text from B, who coordinates those meals, and she said, I really want to thank you guys. How welcoming this this group was for that for their help so thank you everybody thank you and the other invitation would be to um, come enjoy fellowship because you're going to enjoy some leftovers <laughs> from isabel's reception and also from feeding the flathead wonderful thank you so it can be a little bit um, sobering to go from waving our palms around to starting that sad story of Jesus' death, right? But we all know that death is not the last word. And so our final hymn celebrates that, the, the dance through all of the ups and downs. As we go um, this, this morning... Uh, to whatever comes next, I invite you to um, receive this next song as an invitation from God. Let's stand and sing.
from this place and follow in the way of Christ, who emptied himself for the sake of others. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.